relaxed tension. Uh, or like the this notice in your uh, you know in your mind like a command of attention what does that do you know for me when when the command attention comes in I can to contract the body you know like you go like this <clears throat> and then relaxed attention is is more like open listening it's not it's not a sense of contracting but expanding kind of relaxing and receiving rather than paying attention to what to a command or to a particular object and this uh, this relaxed attention then is where we can reflect because we're when we're when we're contracted and focused on one thing or just reacting then we we can't reflect on on the moment we're merely uh, focusing on an object where when we when there's this relaxed attention then it's um, it's a receptive, reflective state we're in. And that's where we can reflect. Like there's a question here about discerning. Uh, could you please explain how to discern the second noble truth? It's uh, through, through investigating. It's, it's uh, for investigating. Like the second noble truth is uh, the origin or cause of suffering is due to there is always ignorance of vicha from a vicha danha or desire and then upatan attachment to desire is the cause of suffering. So vicha or ignorance of of danha of desire ignorance of desire leads to desire and the grasping of desire this is habitual this is you know the momentum of habit of of just reactivity uh, the conditioning process so we uh, when we investigate the the second noble truth it's not to, it's not discerning but investigating uh, by looking at dhanha uh, or desire, gama dhanha, bhava dhanha, vipava dhanha. So the, the Pali word dhanha <coughs> translated is, to English is desire or wanting something or not wanting something. And so just notice what wanting, wanting something you don't have is like. It's like this. You can, you can discern that the result of of wanting. It's like this. There's this kind of expectation, longing, wanting to get rid of something you don't like. It's like this. So, yeah, it's it's not a, a thinking process, but more just mindfulness. With, and then we discern the the gamma dana, power dana, vipudana, these three categories sense sense desire, desire for becoming, and desire for getting rid of something you don't like. So <coughs> it, it, it's uh, you know the Buddha encouraged this investigating yoniso manasikara this getting to the root the the very foundation of which is ignorance or avicca <coughs> not no and avicca ignorance in this case in the Pali word avicca is uh, is ignorance of the four noble truths doesn't mean being illiterate or 
or not being intelligent. It's just not having investigated, not having insight into these Four Noble Truths. And we, we operate through avicca or ignorance, through habit, through the uh, desire, uh, through habits of, that we acquire from when we're born. The insight into the second noble truth is to let go. So it's like upantana or grasping or clinging to desire is uh, to be to be witness to to observe it. What is it like to really hold to desire to obsess yourself with a desire for something and. Uh, and and then there's awareness of that. I mean, if you if you're not just reacting that with some idea, you shouldn't have desires. Because sometimes we we think that we shouldn't have desire, but we're investigating desire. You have to know desire uh, to to be able to let go of it, because the desire the desire to get rid of desire is still desire. You know, you can't win on that level. <laughs> it's just a catch-22 problem. So you, <clears throat> you, 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 it's not to get rid of it, but to understand it, to know it. Gamma dana, desire through, there's a sensory, wanting sensory, pleasant uh, sensory experiences, or it's like this. It's not, and the discerning is, is discerning it. It's like this, rather than judging. I shouldn't have desires for sense pleasures. Like when we come become puritanical <clears throat> and very idealistic, then we think a, a good Buddhist monk shouldn't have any desire for sense pleasures beyond that, because that's <laughs> that's that's uh, like being very idealistic and and expecting the impossible because the sense pleasure is it is what it is so i mean you're living in a sense realm <clears throat> so they, you recognize the sense realm is like this it's a body it's your own body it's your seeing hearing smelling tasting touching thinking Desire for becoming, like uh, desire to to become something, to become uh, the prime minister of Australia is <laughs> Bawadana, <laughs> or desire to become famous, or desire to uh, you know like ambition to become CEO of a corporation, or desire to. Just to become a better person is a good desire. I mean, all desires, you know, bhavadana usually, it's either ambitious for being at the best or being good, but becoming enlightened, becoming a stream enterer or an arahant, or desire to become a Buddha in the next life. Or, I mean, it can be aspiration. Um, in terms of a kind of altruistic aspirations, but it's not it's not uh, it's not judging it, but uh, getting to know wanting something you don't have is like this. Then you're discerning. You're you're not it's it's not critical or judging, but it's discerning. It's like this. So you know you say this. This bowl is like this, when I, and then I'm discerning it. But when I'm just reacting to it, I, I like it or I don't like it, or it's too small or too big, or, <laughs> then you, or I want this or I don't want this. Then you're you're merely reacting to the object. But discerning it means you're accepting it. You're not not saying. You're accepting it for what it is. It's like this, and then you you can really uh, see it. 
you know, because you're not just uh, caught in in just uh, momentary reactions to pleasant sensory experiences or unpleasant ones. Like unpleasant ones, I was in the Siri Raja Hospital in Bangkok. I used to go to autopsies because the, they would allow monks to attend autopsies uh, in the in the morgue there. So uh, I usually go on a Monday because there are a lot of interesting corpses, murders, and <laughs> over the weekend. Bangkok's quite a violent place. And then uh, one day I went in and the kind of man in charge uh, gave me a kind of weird look and said, um, I've got something very special for you. And, <laughs> and I could smell it, you know, it was um, a decayed corpse. <laughs> and they'd found this this um, corpse in, in one of the canals in Bangkok. It had been there for several days, so it was uh, ripe and decaying, and, and it was in a special room. And so the man opened the door to the room, and uh, this the odor was so repulsive. You know, I just wanted to withdraw, not go in. You could feel it resistance, physical resistance to going in into this room. And then I kind of made myself go in and there was this bloated corpse. And in this room, and you look at the ceiling and that, these bloated corpses sometimes explode. <laughs> and, then, and then your mind starts thinking, I hope it doesn't explode while I'm in here. Because <laughs> it was very uh, full of gases and uh, and um, utterly repulsive and uh, putrid. <clears throat> so I went up using willpower. Went up, r stood right next to it, and and just started discerning it rather than just thinking I don't like this. I want to go, or this is disgusting, or the way that I might you know react to it emotionally. I was aware of the emotions and as I as I uh, patiently accepted my my negative feelings they faded away and then I could really observe and discern this this object which was you know if I said repulsive it wasn't I wasn't making it repulsive through thinking it is what it is and then you begin to see the wonders of decay because uh, decay is quite quite a marvelous uh, thing that happens to to uh, corpses. Imagine if 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 human corpses never decayed, we'd be <laughs> we have another problem: kind of permanent plastic corpses dating back to Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, but because, uh, I mean, this is absurd, but it's a reflection and, and, and the discerning uh, a putre, putrefying corpse is, you, you, it doesn't mean you don't feel anything, but you're aware of what you're feeling. And then the feelings like being repelled and, and uh, wanting to think how awful it is, you stop doing that. And then you you uh, experience dispassion. I spent maybe forty minutes to an hour just uh, meditating on this um, putrefying body, and uh, when I came out, I was I was experiencing dispassion, which is very cool. It's a very extremely pleasant state of mind and uh, you know it, 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 I, I wasn't uh, you know you realize that by accepting what you're feeling 
being patient with it, then these 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 habitual reactions of liking or disliking uh, dissolve, disappear, cease. And then what's left is is what it is. You know, it's still a you know, you know it's a decaying horse, but it, it's it's not. There isn't this emotional uh, um, reaction of aversion and disgust for it. I, like this is investigating, yes? understand the first noble truth, uh, awareness is necessary. Will this awareness take us through anicca and anatta? Do we have to contemplate anicca and anatta to discern the first noble truth? Yeah, well, that's the point, too. <clears throat> it, it, I mean, the three, the dry lakana, the three characteristics of existence are there for they give you a slightly different perspective on the same thing. Like you, the feeling of uh, one, one, usually it's a nature that is emphasized because that's quite obvious that, uh, you know, just on an intellectual level we know that everything's changing. So uh, intellectually it's, it's not a... a <coughs> A problem, but to actually witness to to change, to to tune into changingness of a of what you're feeling in the present is uh, is is discerning it, discerning dukkha. Uh, no longer from, like, as I was saying before, not just reacting to it, ignoring it, or seeking happiness, but uh, we call embracing it, or letting it be like this. And then, the, if you take a Nietzsche as a subject to contemplate it, you're, you're pretty tuning into its changing nature. So you're 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 noticing that when you when you use when you're contemplating an impermanence or nature, then you're you're not just thinking about it; you're observing it, watching it change. And then dukkha is, is follows from that that it's that conditioned phenomena is. Its very nature is changing, so that there's nothing, you know. Even happiness changes. It, you can't. Uh, there's no such thing as permanent happiness. So when we have happiness, but it's also changing, and then, and so it is unsatis. It's basically unsatisfying, or, or you know, English word suffering, or. You know, uns unsatisfactory is less severe, and then then uh, anatta, no, non-self, because then that's that I found the most uh, difficult to understand at first, because you always well, what is it that's observing dukkha if it's not a self? <laughs> so you, you know, and then. Then the the assumption that the, the, from the ego level that I'm the the person observing dukkha, or is there just observing, no person but observing, and so then this then we then we become become more aware of that the to become a person you have to think you know and that actually. We're not a person all the time, but we assume we are. Like, 
you can say, uh, where is Ajahn Sumato? And and um, say, I'm in, in the room over there. And, the, and they say, Ajahn Sumato's resting in his room. But uh, that's conventional, that's Samut Satcha or conventional reality. But ultimately, I'm not in there thinking I'm Ajahn Sumato resting. <laughs> it's just the. Uh, we assume that you assume that I'm Ajahn Sumato 24 7. But when in the reality of, of, of mindfulness, uh, uh, becoming Ajahn Sumato is, is a convention. And as you begin to, to know that, then you're, you're, you're more aware of anatta, of non self, and of pure conscious awareness, which is impersonal, it's not. Ajahn Sumato's consciousness, or yours. Yes? Indwan is asking about doubt. doubt People yeah. struggle with doubt. How do we deal with doubt, Lumpur? And doubt is a result of thinking. And uh, like um, grasping thoughts, uh, the thinking process. Uh, and uh, just ask yourself for the question, who am I? You know, and, and immediately you, you, there's, there's a not knowing. You, you, but that which is aware of doubt is knowing. Knowing that you can know doubt, but to resolve all the doubts is, you know, you, with thinking is, is impossible. But we, we don't like doubting because it, it, not knowing something, not having a definition, not being sure, uh, is is unstable, and we don't we feel we want stability, even if it's an illusory stability. So, so we we seek stability and assurance in friends and and people smiling at us and saying you're okay, and then we feel fine. And if people don't smile and they look hostile and you doubt, did I do something wrong? <laughs> and you feel unstable, insecure, or you want, you want verification, is everything okay? Yes, it's okay. Are you feeling all right? Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> and so we, we, you know, like, I remember one man in in England. He he was um, he'd take everything literally, like we say, "How are you this morning?" And he'd he'd go into detail <laughs> where I met him, really <laughs> a greeting. You know, "How are you?" I didn't want to really know and say, "I'm okay." <laughs> 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 He'd go in, <laughs> into detail about his physical health. <laughs> but, you know, when everything's okay, then the, it might be okay in the moment, but it isn't necessarily the way things are. But it, it, notice how it says when you, when the, you go home and say everything all right, yeah, it's okay, then you feel uh, okay. <laughs> but when when you go home and somebody says, there's a real problem, then what do you feel? <laughs> We've got an issue to resolve or, or you know, the modern people say, I've got something I want to share with you. <laughs> and you kind of tense up, ready to be told off. But they, <laughs> they say everything's okay. I'm fine. Um, then we feel better because 
that instability when, there, when, that, when there's an issue, when there's a problem, when not, it's not okay, and then we feel dis-ease, we feel ill at ease. <clears throat> and but discerning that doubt then is 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 one of the objects we can use in in uh, with wisdom because the discerning ability is is wisdom it is what it is doubt not knowing being un, un feeling unstable insecure or uncertain is like this it's a mental state it's an aramana and <clears throat> Confusion. We don't like to feel confused by things, and so when too many, uh, we we get too much information, too much demands, a lot of pressure. We get confused, and uh, confusion can also be. It's a mental state. It is a nicha dukkha nata, like like any other mental state. The the they are. Uh, like greed and desire, you know, greed for something, sensual desire is quite obvious, and then aversion, hatred, dislike, that's a easy one to recognize, or fear, or jealousy, but doubt, confusion, insecurity, uh, anxiety, worry, these are these are not extreme, you know, they're not where lust, sexual desire, or anger are very extreme, you know, it's not s subtle, but, but in uh, the more deluded states like confusion, doubt, worry, anxiety, uh, we we can we can go just kind of ride along in, in the state of anxiety or feeling insecure, uncertain, and we we don't like it. We want, why do people take drugs and drink alcohol and and uh, play computer games and all the rest? <laughs> <'Cause> you, <laughs> because uh, so much of life is like that, is, is, is where we tend to worry about the future or, or feel guilt about past, uh, through past memories. And so we, uh, you know, this is with vipassana or insight practice. You're actually discerning the, these as mental states. You're not trying to feel secure anymore, but you're looking at insecurity. That which is aware of insecurity, that's your refuge. Insecurity isn't a refuge. But it's a it's a mental state, an aramana in Pali. Five hindrances. Can you use them as teacher to develop your practice? Five hindrances. Welcome. Can we use the five hindrances, uh, nivarana? Can we use them as teachers? in our practice? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> they, they're, that's a good way to look at them, is teaching. Te what is anger teaching? It's teaching uh, you all about anger. <laughs> or greed, or doubt, or worry, or restlessness, or fear. I mean, all these uh, mental states uh, to see them as teachers is, is I mean you're willing to learn from them that they are what they are and they're impermanent you're not you're, you're not seeing them in terms of personal uh, problems anymore but discerning them as mental mental states mental conditions Yes. How do we 
have attachments towards our family, if such thoughts come into our minds, what would it result? How do we prepare ourselves for the time of our death, the moment when we die? In particular, she is concerned about attachment to family, which may come up at the moment of death. I haven't died yet, actually. <laughs> I don't really know, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, like the, like Lumpur Cha would use in Thai say, die gone die, which is die before you die. <clears throat> and there's a Shakespearean song it goes, death once dead, there's no more dying then, is a, uh, is a, uh, I mean, just contemplate this when you're actually observing the cessation of of mental states. You're 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 willing to receive them and and patiently accept them. They're changing and they cease. Well, that's death. <clears throat> I mean, that's a that's a end of of what began. So when we when we use the English word death, that usually means a physical body, which we have to wait to, for. <laughs> and, uh, and we're not supposed to kill ourselves to find out. But, uh, but to die before you die is, is, uh, is mindfulness. It's literally seeing that, that, one, that all conditions cease. It's the, the insight into the third noble truth, cessation of conditioned phenomena. So uh, this, this, and you observe that you you discern the ending, the the la the desire, the presence of desire, and then when it ceases, you you note the absence of desires like this. So, because desire is impermanent, it's a mental state, then it, uh, it's impermanent, so it ceases. But there's still awareness, there's still discernment, there's still wisdom. Uh, you, you don't, you, you know, you're not dying with the condition, but you're observing dying. And well then, when, in uh, when we die before we die, then we're not afraid of death anymore, physical death. And we can also be, you know, during uh, our lifetime, be aware of attachment to family and and not to think we shouldn't be attached to family. Uh, that's an ideal again, but attachment to families like this, so you're more accepting this feeling of attachment rather than when you you fear I shouldn't be so attached to my family is a, is a kind of judgment uh, like you you, sh you shouldn't be, you shouldn't feel this way or you should let go of your family and these are ideas you might have but in terms of being attached to families like this then you're you're actually observing uh, something that you're f you're feeling in the present, and letting go of that feeling doesn't mean uh, th that you'll never have that feeling again. But you're be using discernment rather than just uh, blind attachment and doubt about yourself, about death, and fear of death. I mean, it, attachment also, like, uh, it, notice that, that the cause uh, of, of suffering is ignorance of each other. So it's not a, like attachment is not the cause, but ignorance. And then from ignorance, desire, uh, desires that arise, the attachment and the result is suffering. But when there's wisdom, then 
uh, you know, we're able to, we're, we're not, that, that means that we don't ever attach to anything, but we know what we're doing. We're not, not, we're not just caught in the momentum of, of habit patterns and, and doubts and self-views and, and likes and dislikes in a, in that we would be if we didn't have, use discernment and understanding into these Four Noble Truths. I'm not from a Buddhist background, but I can, I can certainly see value in Buddhist teachings in terms of being a refuge from the nature of the human mind and the nature of life. But does Buddhism talk about well, why the purpose of, of all of this anyway? Why, why we land here? And the Buddha wouldn't talk about that. <laughs> Because uh, when, when these kind of questions were asked to the Buddha, you know, what is the ultimate meaning of life, or what's the purpose, or who created it, and what was the original uh, moment, and that, and he, would, he would, would call these unanswerable questions, because <clears throat> we start thinking about it, and we form views and opinions. So, He'd always point to the dependent origination, which is the you know d discerning ability to to discern uh, the cause of suffering and it, and its absence, rather than try to figure out uh, you know what's the purpose of life or the meaning or does, is life meaningless? He didn't say it's meaningless or purposeless, but that desire to know that is what we can actually know. Desire to to ha to know the meaning of life is like this, or the purpose of human life is is we can we can say inspiring things is to love and be free and and use positive purposes, or we can say <clears throat> life has no purpose. It's just uh, you know big bang and things go on. And, <laughs> and we're here, and and it, and it kind of uh, is a, is another way of thinking about it. But one still th thinking process comes from avicca. You know, it's not we acquire language after we're born through conditioning, <clears throat> and the thinking process depends on language. And so, rather than than just Use use theory like the Buddha didn't really wasn't interested in theorizing <clears throat> about things like the meaning or purpose of life or ultimate reality. He was pointing at ultimate reality all the time, which is what we begin to discern through letting go of 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 desires rather than trying to figure out with the thinking mind the ultimate purpose of life. <clears throat> it's frustrating in a way because a strong desire to ha life has a meaning and ha our life has a purpose and it gives us, uh, you know, we feel like if my life has a purpose and I'm worthwhile, I must, it's uplifting to feel that one's life has no purpose and meaningless then it just eat, drink, and be merry, or tomorrow you may die, kind of thing. And it gives you no goal. So, inspiration, notice like the word love and, and, and the purpose of life is freedom, and, and uh, we, we use ideals, you know, to, to inspire, to uplift, make us feel good. And inspiration is is like this to feel inspired or to or just to think life has no purpose and then you then you might as well just sensual indulgence eat drink be merry 
be happy because there's no meaning when you die, you're dead, no oblivion. But the reality is we don't know. You know, we don't know what happens when we die or the ultimate purpose or meaning of life in the terms that we want to know through the thinking mind or the desire mind. So, I mean, this leaves you in the state of not knowing. <laughs> I think it's the one thing that, that prevents me maybe from really giving myself over to Buddhism in that uh, Buddhism certainly gives you, in my frame of reference, a good, uh, a good road map to escape the maze. But then I sort of think, is there a reason you're in the maze to start with? Or is the purpose of the whole game to escape the game? <laughs> Well, it's not to say there is no purpose, but to to know what you're actually grasping. That's the the whole Buddhist emphasis is to you know you know when you when you investigate, you know, like people talk about where does love play a role in in Buddhism, and then we have metta, which is loving kindness. And then in Christianity you have unconditioned love, Christian love, or which is unconditioned, which is, and, and, but in like metta or loving kindness in, in uh, Buddhist terms is, is letting things be what they are. It's not judgmental. So, so the basis of, of mindfulness and the reality of experience is, is metta. Because when we, when we, uh, when you know to uh, uh, investigate suffering, you have to have metaphor. It meaning it doesn't mean you you love it, but you're willing to let suffering be what it is, so you can r really see it and know it, rather than just try to get rid of it, react to it out of liking or disliking it. So. Then you think of love as uniting. Love holds things together where anger, hatred tends to divide and separate. And just like even romantic love it holds two people together and then when they hate each other they separate. <laughs> so so that, that is just the way things are. And, and so um, you, one can can say that the, that which holds the the universe together is love, the basic foundation. Then that would be more like unconditioned love in the Christian sense, or metta. And and then metta, there's four four uh, called divine abodes, Bra uh, Brahma Viharas, which are metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. Metta is loving kindness. That's the very basis of of life. It's it, it's allowing things to be what they are, either your 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 own mental state or others. It doesn't mean liking or approving, but in order to really resolve conflicts, and that we we have to accept the conflict for what it is rather than just try to get rid of it or resolve it through power or just, you know, through through intimidation. Like any world conflicts oftentimes, nobody's talking about love or, <coughs> or um, morality or nonviolence. It's about, you know, how to force people to or some kind of um, modus vivendi compromise and so you have you have momentary peace uh, peaceful negotiations going on but they're not based on wisdom or discernment but on intimidation power um, compromise not through wisdom then then um, Karuna is compassion, where we feel, you know, when, when we see uh, the suffering of others uh, or other beings 
the animal world in that we feel there's a sense of compassion for them, for the suffering of others. Because in, the, in this realm that we're living in, there's a lot of sadness. And um, pathos is very much a theme in, in our lives. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise, will become separated from me. This is a monastic reflection. You think, oh, all that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise. I remember when I first reflected on this, I thought, this is really depressing, you know. <laughs> there is, uh, all will become otherwise, will become separated from me. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of, of, you know, in itself, from the self view, maybe it, it, it's depressing, but from from the discerning view, it's the truth. Death is where we separate from all that we love and all that is mine, beloved, and pleasing. And before we die, then we're also faced with like seeing our parents get old, get sick, and die, or loss of friends, or uh, lo we experience before we die a sense of loss of grief is a common human experience that we all share so <clears throat> compassion for the, the unhappiness the sadness the pathos of life is is how we relate to the world around us to other beings and mudita or Sympathetic joy, as it's translated, is, is joy in the beauty and goodness of others or in nature. Like when, when we see beauty, you know, like a flower or something, we feel a sense of joy, joy in the beauty of, 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 of some, some object or in the goodness of others. And and then uh, the fourth is upeka or equanimity. So like mundi, metta and equanimity and upeka are uh, what they call barometers or things we uh, that that when we 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 can as we are more mindful and understand the four noble truths, then we experience upeka or a, a sense of equanimity. Uh, uh, rather than just uh, up and uh, being caught in emotional ups and downs, so these these four divine abodes—they're they, spontaneous. When we let go of ignorance and desire and grasping, then then the, the our relationship, like. My experience in Thailand with Lung Po Cha or enlightened beings is, they, you know, they're not zombies or indifferent to to life. You know, they're they're full of compassion and 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 joy and equanimity because they they they're coming from the wisdom level rather than from just personal habit habit patterns.